Hi, this is April with Holistic Horseworks, and this is all the amazing information that I want to share with you today. In this episode, April shares personal stories about how her passion for horses started and why she developed her program. From her years of work, she has seen how her program helps both the horse and the rider. So April, I'm curious, when did you start riding? Basically, in grade school, every book and every horse program I could watch, the Lone Ranger, everything, I was just enthralled with horses. And I was lucky that I, and every school I went to, I read every single horse book, King of the Wind, you know, it was like a book this big when I was in like fourth grade. And um, my grandma started giving me riding lessons when I was, I think, in fifth grade. Yeah, she would pick me up once a week from school and take me out to the San Francisco Beach Palomar stables and ride this horse. And I hated saddles. I eventually went to bareback. And, you know, it's really fun to see how you could fall and roll off. And but just always enthralled by them. And then we had horses on the weekends from San Francisco. We'd go up to Santa Rosa until I was 17 and got out of it. And we were just the kids that went up with 50 pounds of carrots and 50 pounds of omeline. And we just rode the heck out of those poor three old horses. I mean, they would run when they saw us coming the other way because we were grandkids and this was grandma and grandpa's weekend place. And if you didn't, weren't out riding on a horse, you got chores to do in like 90 to 110 weather, dragging long hoses out to do grandma's plants or something. So it didn't matter if the horse had two shoes, three shoes, limping, coughing, we went out. No water bottles, no cell phones, no nothing. We're in the middle of um, the great vineyards and other orchards. So we just kind of go through, drink out of streams and pick fruit off trees and stuff. And you're just amazed at the things that we used to do. Compared to nowadays with, do you have your phone? Do you have your helmet? Do you have, I mean, we didn't have any of that stuff. And those poor horses, we didn't know anything about worming or taking care of them. And the neighbor was paid to take care of them on the weekend. And mine was so old. His witherbone was like this high, you know, and I was trying to ride him in a bareback pad with a seatbelt, you know, and stirrups. But if you lean like this, you went, thunk. So I learned how to do those voluntary dismounts really good and how to roll. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I added that into my Horse 101 book of voluntary, involuntary dismounts. That's what they're called. Yeah, where you were on the horse just a minute ago and a bunny rabbit jumped out and all of a sudden you're sitting on the ground. (laughs) So, what a hoot. Yeah, now you actually have bareback pads that you can tighten. But back then, it was just a seatbelt that you put together. And you're like, oh, my God, that was so dangerous, right? So, And then um, got back into it, um, midlife crisis, age 30, just wondering what I wanted to do. And I had shoulder injuries and sitting at home and not doing anything and not working. And they're like, oh, I was watching, I think, Karate Kid, wax on. Max off. Oh, maybe I should call a local horse place and see if I could just go groom a horse to work on my shoulders. And then I fell in love with Jerusha, this mare in the cross ties and had dreams about her. And I just like, Oh my God, I have to have that horse. And it was so funny because I was just helping him out for free. And Oh yeah, that horse is $1,500. Like, oh. And, uh, I didn't know that she wasn't broke and I would just play and mess around with her and hop up on her bareback and wonder why I fell off. And (laughs) Oh, she's five years old and she's not broke. What's broke? (laughs) You know, all those things as we get older and we're like, Oh yeah, I got to remember that horse stuff again that I learned when I was a kid. Yeah. But she's, she saved me and she started me on this whole path. And that was just an amazing, the whole, um, Thing. I just did the art of the horseman because of the horse. My whole life turned around because of her. I learned about um, horse body work um, because she was so sore. She couldn't back out of a two horse straight load trailer anymore. Uh, not to feed alfalfa and sweet feed and not to mm-hmm. do all the vaccinations. And mm-hmm. I wouldn't have a six naughty neurotic jiggy horse. So that whole process of learning and, oh my God, now I have this beautiful horse that I can hop on and ride around the arena with no bridle, no reins, no nothing. And that was because of no money, not because I knew anything about Pirelli. You know, I just had no money for bridles and saddles and a lot of time on unemployment to spend with my horse. 
right? like hours every day. So Mm -hmm. I taught her to rear on command and stand on a podium. It was just kind of like having a dog. What do we want to learn today? Picked up all the poop and put it in one pile because I didn't want to go get the wheelbarrow. And I learned that you can actually potty train your horse in the stall by picking it all up and leaving it one area. And within a week, they will only go within 10 feet of that area. It's like, oh my goodness, this makes it a whole bunch easier. That's fascinating. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you see some horses are really tidy and other horses are not so just tidy. Everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. They're just messy. And so you just keep picking up, but you got to kind of leave that pile, you know, and they'll start going. And then you put diatomaceous earth or lime over the areas you don't want them to. Oh. And sometimes you can't change where they pee, but you can at least get the poop closer to where a wheelbarrow can pick it up. Very interesting. Very all interesting. Those little things that you notice when you have a lot of time. And nowadays people have no time. So they're not even noticing when their horse is deteriorating. It's so gradual. Mm-hmm. You know, God, uh, last month he had a top line and this month he doesn't. Yeah. What happened? Oh. I love hearing about all your adventures. I will admit I'm a little bit jealous as well. Will you tell us what happened that motivated you to develop your own program for horses? So what got me on it is I had a jiggy neurotic Arabian horse and I started going to poker rides. If you don't know anything about a poker ride, you go and they kind of mark things and you can pull a card and most of them are quarter horses. Well, we would do that whole loop in about an hour, be back in camp, everyone else is still out there. So we would go do the loop again. it's like a 10 mile loop or something, you know, and, and then they would have the barbecue lunch. So you learn that Arabians are a lot faster than quarter horses and fly through everything. And so then um, I heard about a 25 mile endurance ride and, Oh, you go camp with your horse and you ride in the mountains and the trails are marked. I said, Oh, sounds like a poker ride. So I signed up for it. It was raining. It was one of the toughest rides up in Seattle. And they're all looking at me and I'm signing up the night before. And well, how long does 25 miles take? Oh, about three hours, maybe four. Oh, my horse jigs for three, four hours. Sign me up for the 50. And they just looked at me like, (sighs) and we're out on these trails that were and it had rains and we're coming like on a narrow trail downhill with a sharp right hand turn and my saddle is sliding up on her shoulders because the girth got loose and I have no crouper going I hope to god she knows how to stop and turn because we're sliding downhill and we didn't practice for this and it was just taking time with my horse and I had like little Kmart raincoat and little rubber boots little bottles of Jack Daniels in my pocket to keep me warm going what am I doing out here and they have vet checks and food for the horse. And they're like, yeah, you're doing okay. Keep going. I was like, no, okay, keep going. <laughs> and we finished. And I was just amazed. I didn't have a blanket, didn't know about butte, didn't know about hot mashes for horses. I just had this van, like a hippie van to sleep in. And I was just totally out of my element. And all these people came by and said, wow, we're so impressed. You've never done that before. And you did the hardest 50 in this weather. And I was like, yeah, I guess I did. And they're like, you don't have a blanket for your horse. No, here, let me, you know, let me oh, borrow you this one. And so nice. do you have a hot mash for her? I go, no, but I won this bag of bran. Is that what I'm supposed to do with it? <laughs> and they go, do, do you have any hot water? I go, no, I'm freezing in my van here. They go, oh, well, we'll heat up some hot water. We'll bring your mare. And I just love that whole community of it. Yeah. So that got me hooked on endurance where, where people were just like, wow, we heard that you, you know. And I was like, oh, my God, this is kind of a nice community. You see trails. And so that got me hooked on endurance. But the vets, you know, saying you're grade one or grade two lame and not being able to tell us where it is you know, really got me frustrated. So here you are, you've done all this training, you've paid a hundred dollars, you've taken the weekend off, you've hauled up, you've set up camp and at 20 miles, your horse gets pulled for head bobbing. Well, is it in the left front, the right front? We don't know. Just give them some butte and a couple weeks off and hope it goes away. Uh, I was like, really? And it doesn't really make sense. Okay. So I did that. 
And another month and a half later, go to another ride and get pulled for the same thing. Well, what can they do to find out where it is? Well, we can nerve block it and tell you what it isn't. Okay, and that's three or four hundred dollars to tell me what it isn't. And that and I got four legs on the horse, and that's only right. for one leg. So that's what really started me on the whole process of, you know, where's the horse lame? Where's the horse sore? Um, and just taking classes and each class would kind of miss out on something. So if you learn massage, well, why was the muscle in spasm? And if you learned about body work, well, what about the hoof? And so I just kept taking classes and $17,000 later, and I would bring the classes back to my endurance horse Tiki at the time and see what he liked out of each. And that's how I developed my program. I'm like, well, nobody's really addressing the hind end. So what do I have to take to really address the hind end? Right, right. Because by the time a horse is bobbing, you know, and uh, bobbing lameness, I find that they're actually lame on three legs, not just one. Oh, it's in the left front. Yeah, but look at the right rear and the right rear is showing to the left front. So now the right rear and the left front are sore. So now he's going to throw stress to his right front. So the only sound leg you have on that horse is the left rear right now. And they go, oh, okay. So butte in two weeks off isn't going to take care of it. Not at all. You know, when your horse is lame, something overworked. Something was too tight. Something stressed or tore or locked up or bone and bone or joint. So I learned to look for the cause. Right. You know, so I could sit there when horses were vetting in for a 100-mile endurance ride and just look at the u neck, roach back, confirmation, hunter's bump, and four hooves out of balance and go, that horse isn't going to make it 70 miles. You know, and that's what's being missed in the endurance ride. You know, you have four feet that don't match. It's like you wearing one high heel shoe and one slipper. Now go climb mountains. It's not going to work. And, well. and wondering what, you know, your, your groin, your knees, your everything is going to hurt, you know, and then riders will work a diagonal. What if the horse doesn't want to work that diagonal? Mm -hmm. What if he's trying to avoid a lameness? Then he's mm -hmm. going to throw it to somewhere else. Well, he doesn't want to do right diagonal. So I have to make him. It's a weakness. No, your right front suspensory is sore. Do you find it's difficult to get humans, the riders, to realize when a horse is it, avoiding something um, or avoiding the diagonal or whatever it is that they're doing, that that's actually the horse communicating to the rider that the horse needs help with something, that something's wrong. Absolutely. So every time I hear people say that, I'm like, can we change that wording of my horse won't or doesn't want to, to is unable to do it comfortably without pain. Mm -hmm. We always avoid pain. Right. So if you watch someone working a horse asking for the right lead canner and you start looking at that right stifle and that left hind hock, you'll see some wobbling because they're overworking for picking up right lead canner um, of a shoulder that can't move correctly. So what starts it can just be the first rib misalignment um, at the base of the neck and that doesn't allow the shoulder to move correctly. So then we're taught that the horse is either left-handed or right-handed, okay? And you have to work the other side more because it's weaker. Well, horses are born with one shoulder coming out in front of the womb on the left side, on this side of the planet, when you go to Australia, on the other side. And that's why our racetracks run to the left. It's whatever leg comes out of the womb first. And in Australia, they go to the right. There was a story about some billion dollar racehorse they brought over from Australia and threw him on a left track and he lamed himself. So yes, we may have predominantly left horses on this side, but them not wanting to work the right side is usually a physical impairment and us asking for it and asking for it. It's kind of like when you paint the ceiling all day and you're reaching on the ladder and then you fall asleep in the lounge chair watching TV and you get up and you're stiff and you're sore and you hurt and someone says, okay, get up on the ladder and go paint only with your right arm again. Right. It's when we're in the lounge chair, when the horse is locked in the stall, 
that the lactic acid settles in and the tightness settles in. So you have more of these issues with horses that don't have the room to run and process the lactic acid. And then these are the horses that have to warm up before you can actually ride them. Oh yeah, well we lunge them before we do the yoga stretches, wrong. If you did the yoga stretches first, you'd see that the left shoulder was tighter than the right shoulder and the left shoulder is gonna throw back to the right hind. So that's why I developed my um, yoga for horses, which is a diagnostic tool. And if you do it every day, you'll know that you have a glitch before you actually tack up and ride the horse and yeah. something more to work on. So when people don't have the advice that they need, it's because everyone's been doing it the same for the past 20 or 30 years. And the trainers will say, oh, it's been working like that for whatever. We put out top performance horses that slide or stop or spin but for how long? One year, two years, you're injecting joints and they have ulcers. Ulcers is internalizing emotions and being in acidic pain. So my program, we look at the whole horse. Right. If they don't want to do something, you go watch horses in an arena. And as soon as a rider asks the horse to do something that is uncomfortable, you'll see ears pin and tail swish. Mm-hmm or even just putting the saddle on the horse mm -hmm. and they're shaking their back and the ears are pinning and, the, and they're swishing their tail and, oh, he just doesn't like that pad or he just doesn't want to be tacked up. I say, you know, can, come here with me. Let's stand 10 feet behind your horse and stand up on a bucket. What do you see? You see one butt higher, one side back lower, one shoulder bigger, and the withers are crooked. Now look at the underside of your saddle. You're putting a straight, firm thing and tightening it up with a girth on a crooked horse right? and working them every day. So if you ride once a month, they're probably a happy horse. If you ride four or five times a week and you're squeezing that body, that crooked body into a straight form and it's working against them, then you get your training and behavioral issues. Oh, my horse is bucking now or he won't engage the hind end. Can we please change won't to unable to? Yeah. And how can I fix this for them? Because they're sentient beings. They really work from love and your mm -hmm. heart. And they just want to give everything to you. Yeah. You know, they nicker at you and they <laughs> see you. So yeah. why are they pinning ears, swishing tail and biting you when you put the saddle on? They're, My they're communicating DVD, back to you. Something's yeah. wrong. Yeah. The first DVD I ever made was the horses are talking. Are you listening? <laughs> People say, oh, you're a horse whisperer. I said, no, they still ask the horses to move through pain in a nicer, slow, we're going to be out here all day until you give me what I want. I'm the horse listener. Where in your body are you uncomfortable? Let's fix it and let's go have fun and have a nice ride. Right. People do my program and they unwind their own horse and they're like, oh my God, everyone in the barn asks if I bought a new horse. Where is that dangerous one that used to chase horses out of the field and because even the color changes when you do my program, they dapple mm -hmm. out, they get a lighter color, they're assimilating their nutrition and their minerals. And, right. you know, people who haven't seen the horse in a couple of months, they go, Oh, look, so you bought a new horse. No, nope, same one. Just fix this one. It was a lot cheaper because <laughs> you have so much money into buying and shoeing and saddles and this and that. And horses are not disposable. No. You know, you don't just go get another one. Oh, no. yeah, we have another $10,000. No. We'll just go get another reigning horse. Well, if we had taken care of the feet and the body on this reigning horse, he'd still be winning for you. You know, and that horse that can't, you know, carry the adult anymore could still be doing 4-H juniors in their 20s instead of being done. Yeah. So I'm very passionate about teaching Absolutely. people how to do their own horses at home so they're not passed around and sent to slaughter and feedlots because your horse should really be sound and rideable through their 30s. As I listen to you, I'm in awe of how quickly you can identify so many things that are going wrong with the horse that are fixable. Well, when you finish your home program, you'll learn that you can release atlas and axis, mid ribs and hips with the saddle on. You're just going to be, oh, wait a minute. He can't engage the hind end here. Let me just push here. Boom. Oh, look, the hips are in balance now. Look, now you actually have a hind end to use. And people are going to go, oh, geez, magic. <laughs> Would you do my horse too? <laughs> and that's what I love sharing is just enabling women everywhere to just learn how easy, quick little fixes 
is going to give them the lifelong best friend that actually chooses to stay under them and the best ride possible. I would go out there to my paddock with my halter and lead rope and say, go bye-bye. And my two horses would run up to the halter and just jump in the horse trailer. And people like, really? (laughs) That's not normal. (laughs) And they're Arabians and they just walk up to the wheel well. And I put my leg over and we walk off on a loose rein and they're top 10, 50 mile endurance horses, but they don't hurt anymore. So they're really happy to join with humans and be a part of it. What are you noticing that's unique about your program? What I'm doing is most women um, don't feel they're good enough. So I'm empowering them that, Mm -hmm. yes, you can go out there and do five bladder sweeps each side on your horse tonight, and you will notice a difference in the morning. Well, how do I know if I'm doing it right? Because you'll notice a difference in your horse in the morning just because you went out there and did that, you know, Mm -hmm. and after you've done it a hundred times, you probably went, oh, I noticed I probably wasn't doing this right. And you can improve on something. But most people just don't go try it. They just have don't to try know how to do it or, you know, a Pirelli trick or a Masterson trick. It's too overwhelming. I'm not good enough. And so I empower you. I empower you to go out and do it. And then I show you in simple, easy yes. things without a lot of big words. If you push here and it hurts, this is what you do to release it. And with my soft positional releases, releasing the fascia, you're actually releasing the whole skeleton without actually doing chiropractic. So Which is it's amazing. Safe, it's safe for people to do on their own horses. But if you don't balance getting things in alignment and the soft tissue, you, you can't resolve the problem. Yeah. That's if my your whole back is in spasm on the right side, you know, and you're walking around all day with um, a purse on your right side, how are you ever going to straighten out? And that's our horses with riders that are out of balance when their body's already tight. So I just teach easy ways to keep your horse healthy, sound and rideable through their 30s. And that the worst thing we can do is not try. Yeah. For this podcast, what can people expect? Um, well, we'll be asking for real questions and real stories so that someone's like, oh yeah, that was my horse or she just described my horse, you know, so people will stumble across the 140 helpful videos I have on YouTube. Sometimes, sometimes they're too media overwhelmed to go watch, you know, things, but if you put in sore horse, bucking horse, you'll probably come across one of my videos. If your horse is bucking, it's probably because you're putting a straight saddle on a crooked horse. Now let's, you know, look at the back from on top of a bucket, crooked. Now 10 feet behind the horse, you squat down and you look at the, the four hooves from the rear and they're crooked too. So how in anything can this body hold its alignment? So yes, you're having someone do body work on this performance horse at $150, you know, every 14 days, but you're missing a whole bunch of this. So it's just waking people up in little bits because it really is information overwhelm. So I want to have, you know, a question answer thing and different subjects so people can go back to it. Oh yeah. What did she say on that one? And it to be more with today's problem horses, you know, why are we having more uveitis and autoimmune and allergies? You know, we didn't have this 25 years ago, but we also weren't using the knotted rope halters that create more damage when the horse pulls back when tied because nothing gives the older halters, the flat web with the cheap rope, something would break and off went your horse. You know, so we have more issues with our horses nowadays than cowboys had 20, 30 years ago. So the same training issues aren't working. Mm -hmm. The same methods aren't working. And it's time to show people new ways to treat these sentient beings. So everyone, thank you for being here with us on this recorded call. We will be doing live calls in future and be taking live questions. For now, you can contact April with any concerns you may be having with your horse. April at holistichorseworks.com. I always love hearing from you guys. And please check out all the free information on my YouTube channel, Holistic Horseworks, as well as my free ebook at horseacademy101.com. And share that with all your friends, please, so that we can help more horses everywhere. Looking forward to sharing more information with you in future. Thank you for being here.